I, I I'm a I I'm a, a really really blessed man. I have uh, I had a couple trips on my bucket list, like two actually, and I already did them. So I don't know what that means. I hope it's not a bad omen or anything. But um, my first was to go see where Jesus lived and walked, and um, to to see things that he would have been maybe pointing to during an illustration or whatnot. And um, I got to do that when I was like 25, and um, it it was powerful. Um, or, yeah, it was, it was a very, very powerful thing. And if you ever get a chance to do that, go on a trip um, to see Israel. Um, the other tr place I wanted to go was to Italy because I'm Italian uh, and I grew up in an Italian family. And so I wanted to go see this, this, this place that I had heard much about from my grandmother and she had been raised there. Um, and so Christina and I got a chance to go back there and um, we got a little bit of museum fatigue, which is where you see so many museums that they all blend together. <laughs> we had incredible food, um, but there were some exhausting days, and we kind of ended our trip by going to a very restful place called Cinque Terre, which is five little towns like located on the water, and by the time we got there, we were just wiped out. So we checked into our, our room, and uh, the, the guy there kind of told us a good restaurant to go to, and so we wandered down to the restaurant, and um, Cinque Terre is the birthplace of pesto. So Christina ordered the pesto gnocchi, which is like little dumplings covered in pesto. Um, pretty good choice. But I was thinking, that sounds pretty heavy, so I should order something to contrast it, like maybe something a little bit lighter. Um, but I can't read Italian. And I took like Spanish one, which really doesn't prepare you for Italian at all. Um, so I, I looked at the menu and I found something with a star that I thought was the chef special. Like that's always probably a good place to start. And it was called Piatto di frutti de mer. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I thought piatto, well, that looks like plato, which in Spanish means plate. So I did, got plate. The frutti, well, fruity. I like fruity things, and that would that'd be perfect. So I'm thinking like fruit and crackers, maybe a little bit of cheese would come with it, and then that would be a perfect contrast for Christina's pasta. Here's what I actually got. <laughs> Something that looks like that. It was a plate. Yes, got that one right. It was fruit, but it was fruit of the sea. I didn't care about the <laughs> demur, or, which is of the sea. So, um, yeah, you can pick that up. That's pretty disgusting. Um, <laughs> it was actually, it turned out better than I thought, but it certainly wasn't what I expected. Um, we are continuing a series right now in the Lord's Prayer, and we're, we've, we've made it past addressing God our wonderful Father who is with us, who's also the ruler of the universe. Um, and, and the first thing that Jesus encourages us to ask God when we come before this incredible God is, let your kingdom come, thy kingdom come. And though we've said those words maybe hundreds of times, do we even know what it is that we are asking for? And if we got it, would we even like it? That's been the thought that's been rattling around in my brain for this week. Um, when you think of a kingdom, I don't know what comes to mind for you, but I grew up in, in Southern California, so I think of uh, the Magic Kingdom, Disneyland. It's a very small kingdom, but it's clearly ruled over by Mickey Mouse. And, and it's a lot of fun there. It's happy there, um, except when there's long lines and children crying. But uh, the other kingdom that I think of is the United Kingdom, which completely confuses me. Apparently, it's England, Britain, and part of Ireland, but not all of Ireland. And Dave, you're going to have to give me a lesson on this later because I cannot figure out the difference between Britain, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Um, we think of geography and we think of a king. Some space that is ruled over by a king. Um, and in Jesus' day, there was only one kingdom, and that was Rome. Rome ruled everything. Um, and so when Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is here, I don't think he's speaking about geography, but he's talking about a king. Um, the ultimate message that Jesus gave, the center of what Jesus talked about was, was simply this. Like his sermon uh, that he gave again and again and again is, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. Repent, the kingdom of God is near. That's it. And it's basically, repenting is not curling up in a corner and feeling bad about what you've done. Repenting is, live differently. Live towards God. Stop what you were doing, do something differently, live towards God because God's kingdom is at hand. 
it's staggering how much he talked about that. He talked about it more than heaven, more than hell, more than salvation, and more than his second favorite topic, which was money, surprisingly. In Matthew, um, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is how he talks about it 37 different times. 14 times in Mark, 22 times in Luke, and John figured all of that had been a pretty good covering of it, so he only spoke about it twice. Um, John fills in the gaps that were left in the other Gospels, and with 73 times in those first three Gospels, the kingdom of God was something that was important to Jesus to talk about. There's another 15 in the rest of the New Testament, if you're curious, so we're, we're coming up on 90 now times that the kingdom of God is mentioned. And it paints this beautiful picture of what does life look like when God is in charge? What, what does our lives, what does the world, what does society look like if God had his way? And it is a radical departure from the way that we live. It's a radical departure from how we see things. In, in the kingdom of God, you get things like, blessed are the poor and the meek and the righteous and the merciful and the pure in heart the peacemakers, and the persecuted. Those, those are the blessed people. I think in our society it's often, blessed are the aggressive ladder climbers who will do anything to get promoted. Blessed are the immoral who would exploit others and get rich and powerful that way. In the kingdom of God, when, when somebody hits you on the cheek, you turn to him, the other one, as well. And then love wins the day. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was not that long ago, and the power of what Martin Luther King Jr. did was he put on display how evil evil was by simply sitting there and turning the other cheek. In this society, sometimes it is represented more like blessed is he who hits the hardest, or at least the first, because they'll be the one standing. In the kingdom of God, if somebody needs your coat, you give them your, your uh, shirt as well. And in this society, it, it's more like blessed is the one who stockpiles and builds bigger barns. And I, and I have to say, this is very convicting to me, because I went to the outlet mall this last week. Um, I found some great deals, and I got a new coat and a new shirt, and the only time it crossed my mind that I needed to do something for the poor was, I don't know if I ruined my closet for this, so I might want to donate something. But I can guarantee you that there have been a number of shirts and coats that have been added without me giving one away. Um, I'm thinking about re-engaging the buy one, give one principle. I'm running out of room because my barns aren't big enough, apparently. It's challenging, this thy kingdom come. In Jesus' parable, the kingdom of God uh, doesn't get much easier. The son who abandoned his responsibilities, who wasted all the inheritance, who, who more or less blew it and then decided to come home becomes the hero. And tax collectors and sinners um, enter the kingdom before the pious and the religious. And I sat this week um, in a meeting for some folks who were addicts and I found myself thinking of this and going, they're so desperate for God, man, because their life is over if they don't get it. Maybe that's what Jesus was talking about. What am I missing? Um, the guy who works one hour gets the same pay as the guy who worked the whole day. What's up with that? That's not a good economic system. It feels kind of wasteful. And yet it's grace-filled. And it's loving. Um, in the kingdom of God, there's, there's no poverty. There, everyone gets dignity no matter who they are, where they come from, uh, what they do. And yet we measure folks by what they do where they come from, gender, sexual orientation, everything. And the greatest people, it seems, in the kingdom of God are the, are the most humble and the servant-hearted and the ones who would be the last people that would want to climb up on a throne and have somebody look at them for being great. There's no room for ego or pride or resentment. Um, it's a beautiful image. And if a society functioned like this, it would be, be mind-blowing. Everybody would have enough. Everybody would have a ritual life. Everybody would have um, support and encouragement. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. 
Um, there wouldn't be second-rate people in any way, shape, or form. Martin Luther King Jr., I want to share a little line from his speech that I can never seem to get out of my head. My little children could grow up in a nation where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Um, where little black boys and black girls would join hands with little white boys and white girls, and they'd be sisters and brothers. People who are equals, and all of them have dignity. There was a march yesterday about equality. And it's so hard to get to equality without needing to push somebody else down. It's so hard. The kingdom of God is a beautiful, breathtaking vision. Um, and if we were to get it, life would function so much better. I was reading in the news this week about the coming to justice of um, Larry Nassar, the, the Olympic uh, doctor who was abusing athletes. Um, and the writer of the, of the story had this one line in there. He worked in the, in the shadows, but now he's in the spotlight. The things done in shadows that ruin people's lives don't exist in the kingdom of God because God is present and he is light. And there's no room for shadows anymore. Ecosystems don't die. There's no such thing as an endangered species in the kingdom of God. Um, and we eat healthy and sustainably, and the list goes on and on. And it's this incredible image that works out in so many cool ways. I, I think of, of Alice Gatlin and building community in her neighborhood. The kingdom of God is getting a foothold there because she's connecting with other people. Uh, I think of people who, who just serve and who love and are able to build reconciliation and forgiveness in, in spots where that is not easy. For another, it's recognizing that they're priceless and they're valuable rather than what they've heard in the world this week um, in other news. Wazoo's 2B quarterback, Tyler Alinsky, 21-year-old kid, um, took his life in his dorm room. And no one saw the signs. It wasn't like he was a depressed individual who was disconnected from people and a loner. It was, uh, it was quite the opposite, actually. Um, maybe there was something else there, but, but people are trying to figure out why. And, and there's the possibility that it was his last game, which was really, really bad. And heading into the next year, he would have been the starting quarterback, and a thousand people had posted things about how horrible he was. And maybe he felt worthless and trapped and doomed to fail because of everything that he'd taken in. I don't know. But I do know that in the kingdom of God, there's no reason a 21-year-old would want to take his life. Because that wouldn't be the culture of people around each other. There's a great cloud of witnesses instead that surrounds people and cheers them on to better and better places and onward and upward and go. The kingdom is a good one. Thy kingdom come is a great, good vision that is so easy to get on board with. But if it were to come, would we want it? I think that's a big challenge. There's also one other tension. When's it going to come? Um, is it coming in a while? Is it that day, that, that last day when Jesus will finally set everything right? That we're just waiting for and, and pining for and, and trying to hold on for? Or is it something <coughs> now? And I would ask these questions occasionally in Bible school and seminary. And the professors always got this weird smile on their face. And they said, yes. <laughs> Engineers and mathematicians should not go to seminary. It will drive you crazy. There's not as many definitives. But yes, it is where we're headed. I, I want to read a passage for you. It's, it's from Revelation. It describes the last things. Revelation 11. Or, uh, I'm sorry, 17, 15, 13, oh, no, it was 11, no, it wasn't, oh. <laughs> sorry, not even with bookmarks, people, not even with bookmarks, here we go, I'm giving up on the bookmarks, <laughs> cursed by them. <laughs> You should read Apparently that thing sometimes. Here we go. Um, 
The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. This is uh, Revelation 11. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces, and they worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have now taken your great power and have begun to reign. God taking his full power. He already rules it. He already owns it. And yet, God taking his power and reigning over every bit of it. It's a pretty amazing vision. Isaiah. Christmas passage. You heard it before. I want to read it again. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. And of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He'll reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty is going to accomplish it. This is what God wants, and it's what God will do. That is where we're headed. And it is my greatest hope to see that world come. It is also incredibly challenging to me, because to the extent that my life does not match up with this kingdom, I know it's going to have to change. And frankly, the sooner the better. Um, I don't want to invest in something that is going to get destroyed. And I don't want to be the type of person who needs a massive adjustment because the kingdom of God arrives. The abundant life is available for us, and it's available for us now, and God wants to give it to us. And the question is, <coughs> will we take it from him? Um, when we put God in charge of areas of our lives, we, we get to start down that road of seeing what the kingdom of God can do ahead of time. We get a little taste of it. Um, like I said, I grew up Italian. That meant I got to grow up in a kitchen with my mom when she was cooking Italian food, and that's a pretty good place to be. And mom would be cooking things up, and, and it wasn't quite dinner time yet, but my job, my first job, when I was especially little, was chief taster. Mm. That's what I got to do. So as things were ready, I would, I would get a taste of it, and it wasn't the full dinner. It wasn't there to completely fill me up there, but I sure got a taste of something good. And when we put God in charge of areas of our lives, we get a taste of what could be, and it's very, very good. But it will also change us. Every little kid, when you ask them what they wish for, one of the easiest answers that they can give, one of the things that they, they instinctively know they want, as well as every person who's ever been in a beauty pageant who's looking for an answer that everybody can get on board with and won't irritate anybody, <laughs> says, world peace. <laughs> world peace and puppies. Those two things are good, no matter what you do. World peace and puppies. Um, who would argue that the kingdom of God and, and world peace would be a bad thing? But it's not that simple, is it? There's a little bit of a rub. If, if, if uh, God got to do everything that he would do, we might lose a little bit. And, and therein is the challenge. Um, a kingdom only has one king. You don't hear about kingdoms with multiple kings. Um, that's actually called feudalism. And feudalism, the core word is feud. They're battling. Um, I don't watch Game of Thrones. I know a little bit of European history, but what happens around thrones and battling people who are on power is not good. What I know is there was a whole lot of rulers who only ruled for a year or two or three, and then they got killed because somebody else was seizing the throne. Um, and oftentimes, friends, it feels like that in my life. On the one hand, I want the kingdom of God more than anything. And then the next moment, I find myself going, yeah, but I want that instead. I want to be in charge. I want to make my own decisions. I want to buy things for cheap uh, rather than that will help other people or that are sustainable. And, um, and Jesus knew this. Like one, of the, one of the things that he had to say was, you can't, be, you can't have two masters. You're going to serve one and you're going to hate the other because one's going to get in the way of the other one. Uh, you can't love God and money both and have them both as your number one priority. Uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too, which I always thought was the dumbest cliche on the planet. Because who wants a cake that they can't eat? Um, but what that means is you can't have it both ways. Um, 
We want our kingdom come, but we also want God's kingdom come. And there's some challenges there. Um, one of my routines is to go out and get the mail. And um, Christina works from home now, so uh, she's been able to wear a little bit more comfortable clothes and, and the athletic calendar, or uh, athleta um, thing comes and, and offers all the clothes that they have. And what I was excited about was on the back page was this article in it about how they're empowering women in Sri Lanka and um, having them make decisions around uh, how money that is that is being infused into the community there could be put best to use. Um, they took some of the actual workers and made them decision makers. But it might be made, it might be uh, image management because I also looked and they're owned by Gap, which sometimes has a good image and sometimes not so much. So it's so hard to figure out if we buy athletics, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I know it's an expensive thing. That's how much I know. That's how much I figured out. Um, but it'll be worth it if it's making the world a better place, I figure. But then again, I also look on Amazon shopping. I have the app and it's cheaper there. I don't know who made the stuff. It might have been made by a, by a five-year-old in China, but it's cheaper, so I'll probably buy it there. <laughs> oh, the kingdom of God and my kingdom are at tension. There's a story about this guy who's, who's in a service where they're doing baptisms, and, and he goes, man, I want to be a part of this thing, decides to get baptized, and he's, and he's headed up to get baptized to say that God is his Lord and Savior, and then his kid goes, Dad, your wallet is still in your pocket. It's going to get soaked. And he turns to his son and says, Oh, son, the thing that most needs to get baptized is probably my wallet. <laughs> I feel that way. But it's not just money. It's entertainment and travel and how I eat. Um, the kingdom of God, when it runs the show, impacts everything. So there's a tension. Do we really want the kingdom or not? Is it going to come and be a plate of things that are going to force us to make some changes. If we get even more personal, uh, love your enemies. It's so hard to do. Forgiveness versus bitter resentment when you're not treated fairly. Um, I want to say, Jesus, I, I want that, but I'm not ready for that. Not until a little bit of revenge and a little bit of fairness takes place. So how do we get from my kingdom to thy kingdom? We get there through the Holy Spirit. It's the most incredible thing. God not only says, I'm going to come and rule this world, get on board. And then he says, even though you're not able to do it, I'm going to give you grace and forgiveness. And then I'm going to put my spirit in you. And that spirit is going to wrestle with you and nudge you and direct you until you can be on board with me. And then you're going to find life. Um, Luke 17, 20 through 21. Some Pharisees are around and they're asking Jesus, well, when is this kingdom that you keep talking about, when's that going to come? He says, the kingdom of God is in you. Already here being put into the people that will receive it. Um, so the ultimate question is, do we trust God enough <coughs> to let go of my kingdom and put him in charge? Um, and when we do, when we ask for it, like Dave said, he's there, he wants to give it. He can help us find mercy and forgiveness when we don't want to give it. He can help us make decisions. He can make can help us let go of the frustrations that we have and the fairness that we want that doesn't seem to be filled. But do we trust God enough to want what he wants? I want to close with this. Um, I got to go to Mexico a lot growing up. My dad had a place down there. It was like a trailer. There wasn't much to do, by the way. We would just go down there for like three-day weekends, and my uncle would go down there. And my uncle was into archery. And so one of the things that we would do for hours on end is he would put up these targets on the hillside and um, we would shoot at them with bow and arrow um, 
And I thought that was way more interesting than shooting a gun. I've gotten to shoot a gun a couple times, and and it just seems kind of boring, like aim, shoot. Uh, with archery, if you aim right at the target, that arrow goes, it starts to drop before you even get there. So you have to adjust, you have to aim a little bit higher. And when I aim for what I want, I usually don't find abundant life. I find myself landing a little bit short. I end up getting sometimes what I want, and what I want wasn't the right thing. When Jesus says, thy kingdom come, he's almost saying, aim high. Let God's kingdom be the thing that you want most of all, because when you get to aim there, you're going to find abundant life. One of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis is from The Way to Glory, and he says this, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures. We fool around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is being offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to keep making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Thy kingdom come, let's not settle. Let's pray, thy kingdom come, and let's settle for nothing less in our lives than in this world and keep fighting for that because it's a beautiful beautiful place to be in a better place than we could ever hope for or imagine on our own. Let's pray. God, I know that letting go of some of the things that I hold on to is also caught up in this thing of thy kingdom come, but Lord, we do ask thy kingdom come. Come into the families, come into the lives, come into the hard spots, come into the tensions, come into the broken things in our lives and in our world. We need you to exercise your power to make your kingdom that is in heaven here. So Lord, let your kingdom come. That's our prayer. That's our hope. That's our desire. We love you. Amen.